I do want to thank uh, Rick Scaletta and the General McLean School District for having me. Uh, they had me um, a few months ago to train their staff and then he's been contacting me ever since and saying how can we get this information out to all of you. So thank you for um, making this happen tonight. It's going to be very hard to see all of you and I like audience participation. So let's just start by uh, me asking you how many of you are here tonight because uh, you have a child that suffers with anxiety. Can you just raise your hand? Wow, okay, that's almost all of you. That would be a good reason to be here. But my other question is, how many of you are here because maybe you suffer from anxiety and you're hoping to get a few skills to take home with you? Ah, there you go. I love it when my audience is willing to be vulnerable. Notice that I raised my hand for both because I have children that have suffered at different times with anxiety. And I, I literally, my youngest daughter just got her driver's license. Um, a week and a half ago, and I said to my husband, thank God, I don't ever want to do that again, because uh, kids are anxious, and my uh, last one was a very anxious driver, so um, we got through that. Um, so I have children with anxiety, but I also suffer from anxiety, and um, I think you all guess what kind of anxiety I have, but you probably wouldn't be able to guess. Uh, I have social anxiety. So for me, my brain tricks me into thinking um, that all of you are judging me, which you all are, um, and that this is really going to be awful, and uh, it tries to tell me before I do these not to show up, um, and that I'm never ever going to agree to do another one of these. Um, good thing I've learned not to listen to my brain because I know it lies to me. Um, and when I'm done with these, I just am so grateful that um, I was able to touch lives and that you will also touch uh, my life tonight. So let's go ahead and um, get started. Um, we're going to talk about anxious kids and um, what to do about it. And so I, I just want to kind of start by telling you a little bit about um, understanding anxiety in children. And so I'm going to talk a lot, but then I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to tell some stories. And then um, if we have an opportunity, I might ask someone up here to kind of do some role playing with me. I'm going to do this for about an hour, and then I'm going to try and leave a half hour for questions. Um, and that way we can kind of talk specifics if you want. I'm also about to lose my voice, so I apologize if it gets more difficult to hear me. So anxiety is a normal protective emotion um, for all of us. And developmentally, there's different things um, that kids are scared of, right? We all know about separation anxiety, and we know about stranger anxiety, and we know um, that kids begin to get nervous about their peers when they're in middle school and how much more difficult it is. So anxiety is really a normal um, protective function for us. It motivates us to perform well, um, and it also alerts us to danger. So everybody understands anxiety, which is why you're all here, because every single one of you has experienced it at one time in your life and you know it can feel kind of rotten. Um, but anxiety that affects functioning becomes a problem, right? So um, let's just talk about like what do we know about anxiety and, and when does it actually become a problem? We know that anxiety disorders are neurobiological illness, meaning that you're wired for it. So, you know, uh, you know, someone can blame a parent for modeling anxious behavior, but if you've got three children and only one is wired for it, most likely only one is really going to suffer from um, their anxiety, and the other two will just think you're kind of silly. Um, so we know that this is something that's wired with us, and I, I'll show you in a little bit more about what's going on in the brain. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that Kids are born with, with temperament, right? And so we know that some kids have real sensitivity um, to stress and emotions. Um, those kids are going to be like, chill out already. You know, you don't have to be so dramatic. If they could do that, they would. Uh, they were just born with a sensitivity to this experience, these chemicals that are going through their body. And so we know that um, they tend to struggle more, particularly when their brain is sending them anxiety signals. Um, and then we also know that kids nowadays have a very busy life, right? Um, and it's hard for us parents because we really feel like if our kids aren't involved, then somehow they're going to miss out. And it goes all the way to college, right? If your kid isn't on a traveling team, if your kid isn't in AP classes, if your kid isn't um, volunteering, then maybe somehow that's going to affect them in their life and it might affect their ability to go to college. Well, let me be the first one to tell you that isn't true. And probably being in a school, I shouldn't say all that. But, you know, teachers want to encourage our kids. They want them to do well, and they want to live as full life as possible. But we have to be paying attention to when we're living a life that's full and balanced 
versus when we're feeling pressure to do too much because there's expectations put on us. So we know that when kids go over their stress thresholds, they can become symptomatic. And by the way, I want to say to you what I'm sharing with you tonight, you don't have to have an anxiety disorder to benefit from all the things I'm going to share with you tonight. It's going to make sense to you, and I, I think by the end of tonight, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea we were doing it all wrong. Um, and hopefully then you're going to know the way to, to handle it in a better way. Um, so we also know that kids are, are born to listen to this part of their brain. I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, about the brain. But um, they, when they get a thought in their head that something is dangerous or something's going to be uncomfortable, they don't know that their brain can actually give them misinformation. You're wired to listen to this part of your brain, and so you believe what you think. So one of the things I tell kids from the beginning is just because you think it, doesn't make it true, and just because you feel it doesn't make it dangerous, okay? But kids don't know that, all right? And as adults, we also have our prefrontal cortex at work, so we can think through things, we have a wise mind. You know, the younger the children are, the less cognitive ability they have to kind of understand that just because when I go to school and I think mommy's going to die, um, that that doesn't necessarily mean it's true, okay? They believe that if that's what they're thinking, that that's what's gonna happen, which is why they throw such um, huge tantrums and anxiety fits um, going to school because they really believe that something bad is going to happen to you while they're at school. All right, so developmentally, what we know is that um, anxiety kind of goes along with different development, and sometimes people say to me, well, how do you know the difference between something that's just normal anxiety and something that becomes a problem? Um, normal anxiety, kids will have, you know, they'll, they'll be afraid of something under their bed, they'll get afraid of having nightmares, they'll get afraid of um, you not coming home, but they pass through it. It, it, it kind of comes and it goes. If a child has an anxiety disorder, what happens is it comes, it stays, and it grows exponentially. You'll find yourself reassuring them, accommodating them, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is taking over our life, okay? So when anxiety really affects a child's functioning at school or at home or their ability to sleep, that's when you know you've kind of got bigger problems. But again, what I'm gonna teach you today, um, whether they, it's affecting their function or not, it doesn't matter because um, they can benefit from some of this. So then the, the other thing that I teach them is the difference between danger and discomfort. Um, when this part of your brain, it's called your amygdala, sends out signals, um, it's trying to prevent something dangerous from happening. So kids who are wired for anxiety, if, if we're talking like a scale of one to 10, 10 is a panic attack and one is a breeze, they might get chemicals, messages going um, through their body that's an eight to 10 for something that's really no big deal. Let's say these kids are going to the lunchroom, right? And they see all this chaos going on and they see all these kids sitting at tables and they don't know which table to sit at and the noise is too loud. On a scale of one to 10, their brain might say, this is really dangerous and they get flooded with chemicals and it feels like I've got to escape this. I can't eat lunch in the lunchroom. <clears throat> And then by the time they get to me, I'm finding out that they're eating lunch with a guidance counselor or they're not eating lunch at all or maybe they're staying with the teacher to eat lunch because at least they can eat lunch there. Again, you're going to find that that actually isn't very helpful. Um, but I just want you guys to know that their brain is signaling to them that it's actually dangerous to go in the lunchroom, okay? So one of the things I have to begin to teach kids is what's the difference between danger and discomfort? And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in some examples. Um, but, you know, I, I often say to them, so let's, let's do something that's, let's think of something that if I asked 100 people, they would say that that's dangerous. Anybody want to give me an example of something if we asked 100 people, they'd say that definitely is a dangerous situation. Driving in snow? <laughs> I would actually say that's more discomfort. <laughs> um, depending on, uh, although my daughter who just got her license, that might be dangerous. Um, anybody else where a hundred people would say? Skydiving. Skydiving. See, this is interesting. You're an interesting audience. Because I'm not convinced a hundred people would say skydiving was dangerous. Let me give you a couple examples that children come up with, and that is being in a fire, right? If everyone, whoever thinks that being in a fire is dangerous, raise your hand. All right, you all raised your hand. Okay, so I begin to help them understand they know things that are actually dangerous. So then when I talk to them about going to school or taking a test or in, um, initiating a social interaction with a friend, and I say, so now where does that fall between sleeping in your bed, which is a breeze, or being in a fire? Well, now they realize, okay, my brain is telling me it feels like a 10, 
but it's really only maybe a three or a four. And that kind of helps them discern the difference between danger and discomfort. Kids who have panic attacks, it feels like they're dying. And one of the things we say to them is, although it's really uncomfortable, it is not dangerous to have a panic attack, okay? But it's gonna be their job to be able to tolerate all the discomfort that's going through their body. All right, so another question people ask me is, why is there so much anxiety? I don't know if you guys, um, there's a great article, I, I don't know if it was in the New York Times, um, but then NPR had a whole hour-long um, talk on why is there so much anxiety going on? And so, I mean, we can just kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, these are things that we're just believing. I, I'm uh, friends with someone named Anne Marie Albano, and this is kind of her research, is looking at emerging adults, because we know that 50% um, of college students report experiencing severe anxiety symptoms. We're not talking mild anxiety, severe anxiety. Allegheny um, College contacted my practice two or three years ago now, and said that something like half of their student body was on their wait list to be seen by a counselor, and they were desperately needing our help. So the question is, why is that? Kids between the ages of 18 and 22 are experiencing more anxiety than in the past, okay? So some of this is um, related to parents and society who don't allow suffering. We can talk about that more under questions and answers. But over and over again, um, we're always trying to save our kids from feeling bad. And we have so many ways of doing that, right? From medical ways, we can take them to the doctor without a problem. My daughter's living in Ireland right now, and she's taking, she's a nanny for four little kids, all under the age of six. Um, and they have been sick for the last month. Two of them have had strep, two have had pink eye. She literally was uh, FaceTiming me this afternoon, and the baby started throwing up. <laughs> and I said, I'm glad you're there and I'm here. But she said, Mom, people in Ireland don't go to the doctor. I found that to be very interesting. She said none of them have been on an antibiotic, nobody has gone and visited a doctor, and she said, and they just kind of waited out. And I thought, that's really interesting, because in America, we have urgent care, right? And on the news, we have breaking news. So there's always things that are alerting us to saying something dangerous is going on and we have to do something about it. And, it's, and we feel like it's our job to make sure that um, our kids don't suffer. I was seeing someone um, yesterday and her little son has um, really severe anxiety. And so they've been learning this and they've been doing really great work. And she says, we've made so much progress. She says, and then he was home with the babysitter. He's only five years old. On last Friday when it was like 70 degrees out, he was playing and a bug flew by him. And he freaked out, ran into the house and refused to go back outside. When the mom and dad got home, the babysitter said, oh my gosh, I can't get him outside. A bug flew past them and now he's freaked out about bugs. Well, his brain said, danger, danger, right? Now, can we all agree that's discomfort, not danger? But a five-year-old with his brain being activated for anxiety didn't know that. Um, and so the mom, having learned this therapy, said, although this is, Dis uncomfortable, it is not dangerous, and I'm gonna show you. And he screamed and kicked, and she said, I picked him up, and I brought him outside, and I said, we are staying here until we find bugs. And afterwards, the babysitter said, okay, I thought you were being really cruel, but it took about 20 minutes, and the boy started being really curious about bugs and wanting to catch bugs. So she turned it around that quickly, because she learned how not to prevent him from suffering, whereas the babysitter did the opposite, right? The babysitter let him stay in because he was so scared. So also there's too many options and decisions for kids. You know, my daughter is a sophomore in high school. They were doing their scheduling for next year. I can't even believe the amount of options she had for classes. And they wanted her to take three AP classes and a college prep course and on and on and on, and I just thought, no wonder. It's just overwhelming when you have this many opportunities. It's the yin and yang of everything, right? Things are really great um, when we have lots of options and choices, but too many options and choices can create anxiety. Um, immediate gratification through technology. I'm just gonna go through these quicker because I could stay here all day. Um, fear of missing out with social media, social media bullying, all of these things, I wanna be clear, they don't cause an anxiety disorder, but what I say is an anxi anxiety is like kindling. It's just smoldering, and then these things are like gasoline and they make it go up, okay? Um, 
Video games and decreased social skill building. So, you know, video games can be wonderful. They can be a great way for kids to connect with each other, um, but they can also be very limiting socially. And the less contact our kids have socially to initiate conversation, to maintain conversation, the more socially anxious they're becoming. Um, and, like I was just saying, increased exposure to fear triggers. Um, so, you guys now are aware of that, that line that says breaking news. It's on every single news channel. Do you guys realize that? And are you aware that the reason they do that is to activate the part of your brain that says danger, danger, so that you'll tune in and watch them? So now I've just let you in on that secret. And next time you see breaking news, I challenge you to turn off the news. If I could get everybody to do that, guess what? <laughs> we wouldn't have 24-hour media coverage trying to come up with some crisis situation all the time. By the way, my, my son loves to give those little, um, you know, like, did you know? He calls it something else, but he said, did you know that we're safer today than in all of the history of mankind? Did you guys know that? Raise your hand if you knew that. Oh, we got one, two. So, you, you guys are the smart ones. You must see the same YouTube videos he does or whatever. Um, so, our goal is to help kids to be resilient, all right? Uh, one of uh, my sons, when he was in high school, teacher asked him, you know, at the, in, go home and ask your parents, what's the one thing they would love to t have you have taken from high school? And I said to be resilient. Um, does anybody here know a definition for resilience? What do I mean by that? Is someone willing to be vulnerable and raise their hand? Nobody knows what resilience And you can't just yell it out. You've got to raise your hand. Yes? Yeah, something adverse, uh, some adversity. It's the ability to get through something, some adversity and be able to say, I did that. I can handle it. So because you were the first one to actually raise your hand, you get a reward. Uh, one thing I do in therapy is whenever kids work hard for me, they get a reward. So because you're an adult and you probably, oh, I can't do that. You have to come up here. <laughs> so I have a book called Face It and Feel It, 10 Simple But Not Easy Ways to Live Well with Anxiety. My client said, if I could just take you home, I just want to hear your words in my ears, would you please write something? I didn't want to write anything. You're welcome. Thank you for raising your hand. Um, but so I said, I'll write something simple. So rather than you guys having to read these big books, you can just sit on the toilet, read this book, and um, be able to be like, oh, that's right, that's what she said, and really kind of get brought back to tonight and what you learned. So I sell the books um, afterwards for $10. On Amazon, they're like $13.95 or something. Um, so those are the most important things um, in, in terms of why people, kids are more anxious now and what we're trying to help kids do. Let me teach you a little bit about what's going on in the brain because this, um, if you were having a session with me, at the end of the first session, I would be wanting to teach you this because what I find is once kids and adults learn this, it kind of changes how they respond to anxiety. So what happens is there's a part of your brain, it's called your amygdala. It's the part of your brain that um, that records emotional things that happen, okay? So it remembers things that felt bad or felt excited. Um, it's also the part of your brain that alerts you to danger in the future. So its job is to keep you safe, okay? And what happens is it's in the middle of the brain and it's about the size of an almond and its job, um, it, it gets activated right away. So we have a trigger, like I, here I say, uh, the trigger is taking a test. So what happens is immediately a message goes to your amygdala. It's an older part of the brain. It doesn't know anything but to react to something that feels bad or is a potentially dangerous thing. So immediately the amygdala gets activated. And what happens when the amygdala gets activated? Cortisol, adrenaline, and serotonin. Well, cortisol and adrenaline get released and serotonin becomes unbalanced. So let me just kind of explain those chemicals to you. Cortisol is the chemical that wakes us up. About four or five o'clock in the morning, you begin to realize you're hearing the birds sing or you're thinking, oh shoot, I hope I got two more hours to sleep. That's cortisol being released in you. And for people who have panic attacks, a lot of times they have them early in the morning. And panic attacks are your brain's misinterpretation of something changing in your body. So when cortisol is released, your brain misinterprets that as being dangerous. I know how wacky is that, right? 
Um, and it wakes up having a panic attack because it's trying to alert you that something bad's going on in your body when all your brain is trying to do is kind of wake you up, okay? So cortisol wakes you up, right? So if there really were danger, or if there really was danger, we'd want to be woken up. Adrenaline is that fight or flight chemical. It's the thing that gets us to run and get the heck out of Dodge. Serotonin is the mood chemical. It's the thing that makes you feel anxious or irritable or depressed. Um, it's the, it affects your mood, your sleep, and your appetite. So oftentimes, kids who are anxious um, are feeling like, oh, I can't eat, um, I have to go to the bathroom all the time. By the way, we have serotonin in our brain and we have serotonin in our gut. Um, so kids who are peeing and pooping all the time, yep, that's because they're feeling anxious and they have all these chemicals going through their body. The other thing is that we really need to pee, poop, throw up the whole nine yards because if we're going to move fast, we got to get that all out of our body, right? So all these chemicals are necessary if we were actually in danger. But we're not in danger. We're only having discomfort. And kids don't realize that their brain is capable of giving them misinformation, OK? So all these chemicals feel awful. And it's the child, or if you have an anxiety disorder, um, it's your instinct to listen to that part of the brain and do something to feel better. So if someone was afraid of taking a test, they might avoid studying. They might ask their mom or their teacher, do you think I'll do OK? Um, I'm not sure I'm going to do OK. And then the teacher says, you always do fine. Or the mom's like, you got 100% last time. I don't want to hear it anymore. So those are all very natural responses to the amygdala saying, oh no, we got another test. Remember, we hate taking tests. Chemicals go by, you ask for reassurance, you put off studying, or maybe you're a perfectionist and you study till 2 o'clock in the morning. You overstudy, right? But all of that creates a connection back up to the amygdala and it tells the amygdala that it gave you good information. And this is what we know about people with anxiety disorders, is that the amygdala is overactive. If we took a functional MRI, of someone with an anxiety disorder, the amygdala would light up, if they were doing something that was anxiety provoking, it would light up orange, yellow, red, which tells us there's a lot of activity in that part of the brain. So we know the amygdala is responsible for this. And we know that the amygdala can do one of two things. It can, it can give you an exaggerated sense of fear. If someone's flying in an airplane, maybe everybody feels scared, but someone who has a panic attack on an airplane, their brain is giving them an exaggerated sense of it or it can lie to you completely. Obsessive compulsive disorder is when you get thoughts, images, and fears that are the opposite of who you are. So it completely lies to you. If I have a, a mother who's afraid of harming her child, she might say to me, but I would never do it, but I can't stop thinking about it. What if I might do it? That's her brain telling her the opposite of who she is. And, um, and she is afraid that that could actually happen. But we know with OCD that it's the opposite. So what I know about that mother is she's probably one of the kindest, most loving mothers there are. So the amygdala can either exaggerate a fear uh, message or it can lie to you completely. Again, why would children, or for that matter, any of you know that at all, right? So now I'm giving you this information. Now, the other thing is that the prefrontal cortex is the thinking part of the brain. You know what's bad about the slide is the amygdala is missing. That is so interesting. It, it should be red, right under the word amygdala. Do you guys see it? I don't see it. Is, is it a color? Anyways, that's so weird. So anyways, the green button, or the green circle, is the prefrontal cortex. That's the thinking part of the brain, OK? So when we see that we have to take a test, the first message immediately goes to the amygdala. The amygdala says, we hate taking tests. It whooshes all these chemicals through you. You respond before your prefrontal cortex even knows what's going on, OK? So the message to your prefrontal cortex is after the message to the amygdala. Once the prefrontal cortex gets a sense of what's going on, it can do one of two things. It can be part, become a part of the problem. Um, I, I call, when, when I talk to kids, they do this freak out. Oh my god, you'll never guess what happened. It was just so awful. I got to, you know, the, to the um, classroom five minutes late. And the teacher's like, what are you doing five minutes late? And I freaked out, and she freaked out. And I'm like, OK, let's tell the story again and take out all the drama words. <laughs> I got to school five minutes late. My teacher was upset. I felt anxious about it. My teacher said, so have a seat and we continued the class. Well, now that feels much different, right? But the prefrontal cortex started telling a story and thinking about how awful all of this was, right? 
So the therapy that we do with kids with anxiety, but you now that you have this, it's not going to be therapy. You're just going to start to talk to your kids differently about it, is we do two things. We do what's called exposure and response prevention, where we purposely do things to activate the amygdala that doesn't exist in this man. Um, but we purposely do things to activate the amygdala. We make a list of things that they're afraid of or that trigger their anxiety. We rank order them from things that create the least amount of anxiety to things that create the most amount of anxiety. And then we just get started. We start doing the things that feel bad because now these kids have been told, and I even draw the brain for them, five-year-olds get this at some level. I'll say to them, that amygdala, it's being a bully. Let's give it a name. Um, and so they give it the name Charlie. And I'll say, Charlie's trying to tell you not to go to school. And now we know that Charlie uh, isn't being helpful to you. So we're going to practice doing things where Charlie says, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, or ask your mom if it's going to be OK. And we're going to do it anyways. And we're not going to do anything to make ourselves feel better. What happens is if you do nothing and you just let those chemicals go through your body, it takes as little as 15 minutes for the amygdala to realize it was wrong. I say to kids, do you have a dog? And they're like, yeah. And I say, do you ever give your dog like scraps off the table when you're eating? And they're like, well, I'm not supposed to, but sometimes I do. OK, so when your dog uh, gets the scrap, what does it do? Does it like go away or does it want more? And it's like, it wants more, which is why I'm not supposed to give it scraps. And I said, exactly. And so your amygdala is like the dog. The more you respond to these false signals, the more it wants and the more it's going to tell you, which is why kids with anxiety disorders start with a trigger and then they get stuck and then it grows more and more and more. The more you respond to the anxiety message, the stronger the amygdala gets and the more fearful it gets. I say it's like a meerkat always looking for the, you guys know the meerkats in the zoo? It's my favorite animal. If you don't know it, go check it out. They will all be on their hunches looking for potential danger. And that's what your amygdala begins to do, OK? So then it starts to send you more and more danger signals. So the behavior part of the therapy is we practice triggering the amygdala and getting smarter that and saying, ah, oh, you're going to flood me with chemicals, but now I'm on to you. I know that you're giving me bad information, and I'm not going to do anything about it. And their brain will learn not to give them those signals and not to release all those chemicals. The cognitive part of therapy is changing the way they think about anxiety, about fear. So if kids believe it's dangerous, if kids believe it's true, they're going to respond to it. If kids now understand that it's a trick and that they can be smarter than anxiety, I often call it an anxiety game. Um, what can we do to be smarter than anxiety? How did it get you this time? Well, let's figure out a way to get smarter than it. Let's set you up before you get in the car, you know, because maybe they got in the car, but they couldn't get into school. Well, before you get in the car, say to your brain, I know what you're going to do. You're going to try and get me not to go to school today. But guess what? I'm on to you. So I'm going to go sit in the car anyways, and go ahead, bring it on, do whatever you want to me, because I'm not going to get out of the car today to go back home. I will get out of the car today to go into school. And once kids have that language, to talk back to it, they no longer feel like the victim. They now feel like they're chasing after it. Another analogy I use is a bus. I say, you know, let's think about who's driving the bus here. I got to get on with it because I actually have a picture of a bus, and I'll talk more about that when I get to it. Do you guys have a question about the brain? Does anyone want to ask me a question about that? Not that I could see you anyways. OK, we'll move on. So. The question is, you know, what can you do to help? And the reason I have this um, picture is because typically someone who's struggling with anxiety in the moment, all they can see is the tree. They can't see the path. They can't see their way out. The chemicals make the fear seem so real. And people are like, it is just amazing to me that that isn't the truth. You know, even me trying to come to a workshop, and I give workshops every single week, it amazes me that my brain continues to try to say to me that I don't like doing this and that this is dangerous. I mean, you guys can kind of get a sense I actually love doing this. But the fact that my brain would continue to try to tell me that this is dangerous. So your job is to help them find the way out, OK? And I'm going to show you some more things to do that. Um, we also want to make sure that you're on the same team. So <clears throat> the thing about anxiety is that it'll kind of hijack the whole family. Um, anybody here want to like raise their hand if they feel like anxiety has affected their whole family? Yeah, yeah. It is so frustrating, right? Um, and so the, the, 
the response from the child is so exaggerated and so strong, and maybe one parent is going to be like, we just got to, you know, get through this, just, you know, get them to basketball practice already. And maybe the other parent is like, oh, I'm not sure. This time it seems like something's really up, and I think we better maybe see what's going on. Maybe tomorrow they can go. And so now the parents are pitted against each other. The other siblings in the house are like, oh, God, here we go again. Um, and, they're, and they're just like done with it, right? Um, and oftentimes the other siblings get ignored because anxiety can grow and all the attention ends up going to anxiety. So what I'm saying is that we all need to kind of get on the same team. Um, <clears throat> we want to work together to understand. So, so once the anxiety episode is over with, you really want to kind of sit down with your child and say, hey, let's just see if we can understand what triggered all of that. What was going on? By the way, if they have panic attacks, they're probably not gonna know what triggered it. Because remember, panic comes from misinterpretation of something going on inside of you, okay? Um, if they have, and, and what we do with panic attacks is we actually have, have them practice inducing the symptoms of panic. So we have them spin in circles, or we have them drink a lot of Coke and get um, lots of caffeine in them, um, or we um, have them uh, breathe through a straw. But anything we can do to get them feeling dizzy and lightheaded and sick to their stomach, uh, so that they can learn to tolerate those sensations. That's what we do for panic. Otherwise, mo usually kids are able to help figure out, I say that we're just gonna be a kind of a team, we're gonna be detectives, like, what does you think your brain is thinking and what do you think it got scared about? Um, and so once we kind of get together to figure that out, then we can begin to figure out how to begin to face it rather than avoid it, okay? The other thing I really want to say is this is where you contact the school. Now, some kids have lots of anxiety in school, but none at home. And the school's contacting you saying, we're really seeing anxiety in your child and we're concerned about them. And parents will be like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're not anxious. Well, remember, anxiety pops up wherever it feels like popping up. So um, just because they're not at home, they might be at school. The other thing happens a lot, though. Kids are very anxious at home, but they're not at school at all. So a parent might call the school and say, I'm really worried about them. How are they functioning? And the teachers are like, they're fine. You're just being overdramatic. Well, no, you're really seeing how stressed out they are about writing a paper, and they can't even get the first word started. Um, so it's important for school members and um, parents and family members and the child to all get together to say, let's really have a conversation about how this is affecting you and how we can help you face it and feel it. My mantra is face it, feel it, and do the opposite, okay? So if, if your brain is telling you, don't write that word, you're going to start writing words. And it doesn't matter what word you write, you just have to start writing words, okay? And you're going to feel uncomfortable, but the more you practice that, the quieter your amygdala will get, okay? Um, so we're all going to be in the same team. Uh, then we got to play the game the right way. So remember that anxiety is going to suck you in. <laughs> it's going to tell you to protect your child. It's going to break your heart to watch your child suffer. Like that mom with the five-year-old, how she carried him out kicking and screaming. But she had done enough therapy that she knew if she could just get him out there and start to be curious about bugs, she could get him on the other side of it. So anxiety is going to try to suck you in. You need to be smarter than anxiety. By the way, I've been treating the most severe um, anxiety for 25 years, and it sucks me in every day. So, you know, someone with OCD will sit down and they'll start asking me questions. Well, what do you think about this? And I'm not sure about this, and they're wanting reassurance from me, and you're going to learn in a little bit about reassurance. Um, and I start saying, well, I think that's fine. I don't think that that's a big problem. I, I had a mother asking me about whether or not she, her, her son's back was hurting, and she thought probably she should bring it to him to either a chiropractor or the doctor. And what did I think? And I said, well, you know, how long has it been hurting for? Maybe he should go to the doctor. And, she, and, and then we, she kept talking. She's like, well, what, what would you do? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'd have to know more about it. Then she told me, well, she had been giving him a massage, and she couldn't stop thinking that she had bro broken his back. So you got to be careful because anxiety is tricky. It got me. And I was answering questions about whether she should go to the doctor or the chiropractor when actually this was OCD lying to her about breaking her son's back. And I said, well, maybe you broke it, maybe you didn't, but I wouldn't go to any doctor about it. Um, and so we get kind of silly about it and joke about it, but I cannot get roped in to answering those kinds of questions. And those of you who are parents probably have been roped into those kinds of questions. Um, so. Again, you want to uh, know your opponent, know that it's a 
strong son of a gun and it's going to get tricky and you've got to get smarter and wiser. It'll suck you in, your child will struggle some more, and then you all sit down and you say, okay, wait a minute, it's still getting us. How does it still have power in our life and what do we need to do that would be the opposite of giving it power? So, <clears throat> there's my bus. I told you I had a bus. Um, one of the things, if kids are really struggling with anxiety, I often say when they come in to me, okay, everybody got to let me drive the bus because I know what I'm doing. I know how to get your child well. And typically a child particularly, well, I was going to say particularly adolescents and teens, but I, I've had four and five-year-olds in my office where they are no way giving up the um, steering wheel because they are so frightened um, and they have to control all of it. By the way, oftentimes parents will bring an anxious child to see me and they're really angry and they're like, you know what, I don't really care about the anxiety disorder, just do something about their anger. And so another little tidbit is that their anger will quiet down when their brain quiets down and so I have to treat the anxiety first, okay? But sometimes, well, so kids, I, I really believe in respecting kids and I want them to drive the bus, I don't want them sitting on the back and letting anxiety drive the bus. Um, so I want to make sure that if a child has the ability to be a part of this and l talk about it and get to school on their own or get the paper started on their own, that I let them um, do that because I really believe in respecting children. But sometimes you need to drive the bus. So if your child is saying, if you think, ah, oh, I really do, after listening to tonight's talk, I really think they need to get some therapy like this, and they're like, no way, I'm not going, remember, you're the parent. And they don't need to suffer like this, but they don't even know that. They don't even know what they don't know, okay? So make the appointment, tell them they have to go three times, and if after three times they don't feel like it's helpful, well, then you'll have another conversation about it. But sometimes you have to drive the bus, okay? Um, so the first thing we do is we help them be brave. Um, so are any of you, you know, sometimes people say to me, it isn't fair the images that I put up because sometimes they trigger people. So does anyone want to raise their hand if they have a fear of spiders? Oh wow, we've got a lot of you. Okay, well, I'm not going to apologize, um, but I am going to ask that you just kind of sit there and tolerate it. Some of you might find that you're just going to try to avoid looking at the picture. Um, and some of you might be able to look at the picture, but you're saying inside your brain, um, well, it's just a picture, so it can't hurt me. If I'm having a child learn how to be brave, then I want them to consider all the possibilities. The two main things we're working with with children with anxiety is their ability to handle uncertainty, I don't know if the spider will hurt me or not, and distress, I feel really scared about the possibility that that spider might hurt me. And then we teach them to take risks anyways, okay? So a cute little story, how much time? Oh, I don't have enough time, okay. Except I wanna quick tell you this. Uh, so I, I was asked to come to Gannon every Thursday night and just be in the union and teach anxiety skills. And so I had this kind of following, these kids would show up every Thursday night. And so one time we were gonna do exposure therapy with spiders and so I went to Buzz and Bees and I got a tarantula and um, I brought it there, and I have my own concern about tarantulas, but I always try to do what I make my clients do. So we just, everyone looked at it in the cage, and we kind of talked everybody through it. How do you handle it? What is your body posture? Are you kind of scared, or are you showing uh, the spider in your brain that you can handle it? Um, what's your language? Oh my God, oh my God, I don't want to look at that. Or is it like, okay, this feels uncomfortable, but I'm going to look at it anyway. So all of those are important pieces. And so we all got around and eventually someone was brave enough to take the tarantula out. And so a long story short, at the end of this whole hour, uh, a woman was letting it crawl up her arm and it uh, spun a web. So I'm like, well, listen to all you. Um, so uh, I just activated your amygdalas, by the way. So I took it off of her, I put it in the, in the thing. I didn't really know what that meant. I brought it back to Buzz and Beast, and I said, the tarantula spun a web. And he said, do you know what that means? Anybody want to guess what that means? It, it lay an egg, it was what? Un comfortable? No, it was scared. Turns out we were scaring the tarantula. I felt awful about that. Okay, so what you're beginning to see is that now we, you know, so we have a baby here. This is my young, is she gone? To the lady? She's here, okay, she's there. Uh, my youngest audience member ever. Well, when you raise her, please, or it's a her or him? Her. Her, okay. Hello, sweetie. So now listen to me good. 
Because as you're raising her, what I want is for you to help her be brave and courageous. When she gets scared, it would be normal for her to be scared of things she doesn't know about. Hold her hand and say, let's be brave together and get closer to it and be curious about it. We want to help our kids purposely seek out discomfort. You've been raising your kids to purposely move away from discomfort and to do whatever they can, I know, I hear you, um, whatever they can do to feel safe and comfortable. But if you want them to truly live well, then you want them to be able to seek out discomfort, to take risks and to handle it, okay? That's my goal is the kids say, I, I was seeing a boy with OCD through high school, and it was time for him to go off to college, and it was our last session. And so we were going, I was kind of tricking him, like, okay, what would you do if OCD said this, and what would you do if this happened? And he said, Kimberly, we don't even need to practice this, because what I know for sure is that OCD is going to be part of college, but what I've learned is that I can handle it. And I was like, oh, God, it doesn't get any better than that. I knew he was going to be okay. And so that's what we want. You know, when I ask parents, what do you want for your child? What are the two things that they say? Happy. I can't really hear you guys. Happy and healthy is typically what they say. And I say, well, that's great. I want that for my kids too, but they don't really have to work for that. That just kind of comes. What we really need for our kids is to be skilled to handle adversity, to handle anxiety, to handle those awkward conversations, to handle flunking a test. So if I've got a perfectionistic kid that I'm working with, guess what we're practicing? We're practicing doing poorly on a test. We're practicing writing a paper without good grammar. By the way, these kids typically do really well. So the idea of getting into trouble just freaks them out. But what happens when they get to college and they flunk their first calculus exam like I did? What happens when they get, you know, go through 20 interviews out of college and they don't get a single job? They are not equipped to handle that. So start with the baby. Start teaching her how to be courageous, how to handle discomfort, and purposely look for those opportunities. And then here's the uncertainty piece, right? So <clears throat> oftentimes kids are going to come to you and they're going to ask you questions. That's appropriate. You, I say to everybody, you can always answer their question once. I want to make sure kids have facts, not fears. So if they're afraid of something and it's in the future, um, I don't want to talk about something in the future. But if they don't have good information about something, I want to make sure that they have good information, okay? But the other thing I want is for them to be able to handle not knowing some things. So if I'm getting a kind of a sense that a child is asking me a question and they're feeling anxious about it, if they don't have good information, I'll give them good information once. If they're continuing to ask for reassurance or they want um, to feel better about it, then now we're getting into anxiety and the amygdala circuit, right? Now you guys get it? The more I answer their questions, the more I become a part of the problem and I'm helping connect the circuit and their amygdala says, see, I knew we needed to know the answer of that or we weren't going to be able to be okay. And so then they're going to come to me with more questions. So that's when I start to say things like, well, maybe, maybe you'll have a good day, good day today, maybe you won't have a good day today. Uh, maybe you'll have diarrhea today, maybe you won't have diarrhea today. I mean, I'm talking like this with you guys because that's what kids are afraid of, right? Maybe there'll be someone to sit at the um, lunch table with you today, maybe there won't. Let's sit down and figure out a strategy on how you're going to handle it if someone doesn't sit with you at the lunch table. Okay, now I'm equipping them with how to handle their fears and anxiety rather than having them eat with a guidance counselor and never learning these skills. Is this beginning to make sense to everybody? Okay. <laughs> that was a yes. Uh, I'll take that as a yes. Um, okay, so the rule, uh, understand the rule of opposites. So in anxiety treatment, um, we say that this is um, the paradox of anxiety. So what we resist persists. And you're going to see that everything I'm saying is kind of the same. You're kind of going to get this by the end here. So uh, the more we fight anxiety, the stronger it will get. Because your amygdala says, something bad must really be going on because you're crying or you're screaming, you're not going to school or you're not studying, you're studying until 2 a.m. Your amygdala is learning by everything you're doing, okay? So the, the simplest answer to anxiety, anybody want to answer that who's been to, I, I have people who've been to many of my workshops. Who can I pick on? 
What's, <laughs> what should you do if your anxious brain starts sending you messages? It starts with an N. Nothing. Who said that? <laughs> Good job, Kim. <laughs> so when, when your anxious brain is saying, oh my gosh, I don't think we want to study for a test. Now, when I say do nothing, that doesn't mean don't study for a test. That means continue to do the next thing as though you didn't feel anxious. An easy thing to say to your child is, if you had a headache right now, would you go to practice anyways? Would you go to school anyways? I tell people, and by the way, they better be going to school with a headache, right? We all go to, I'm here right now and I can tell I'm getting sick. We, we show up for life even when we feel uncomfortable. Now, anxiety can be such a powerful force that it'll convince us that it actually is not in our best interest to do that. But if they change the way they think about it, that's the cognitive part, and they say, okay, if this were a headache, what's the next thing I would do? Well, I'd get out of bed and go take a shower and see if I feel better. Well, I'd go eat some breakfast before I go to school. Well, I'd go to school anyways and wait to see if my headache gets worse before I you know, go to the nurse's office. So you want them to keep doing the next thing as though they don't feel anxious. And the more they can just kind of keep pushing past it, I, I had a man in my office on Monday, and I said, well, you know, how are you doing with all those anxious thoughts? And he says, I just keep hearing you in my head saying, just keep going, just keep going. Don't pay attention to those anxious thoughts. And it's been working for him. He just keeps going, and he's not connecting to the content of those anxious thoughts, OK? Um, so what kinds of things make it worse? Well, the opposite of do nothing, pretty much anything you do makes it worse, OK? If you reassure them, if you don't have them don't, not go, if you help them write their paper, um, if you give them an excuse not that, you know, that they were sick when they had anxiety, call it what it is. I appreciate all of you raising your hand who said you're anxious. It's about time we all just own our stuff, right? And the good news is that we really know how to help people with anxiety. So there's no reason not to just ask for help. Um, so this is an example of something that happened to me. I was on my way to Buffalo to give a workshop, and I, I hit a bug storm. And um, I don't know if I even hit a bug storm, but what's the first thing you do when, when massive bugs, it was much worse than that, I just want you all to know, but massive bugs hit my windshield, what's the first thing you would do? Yes. Turn my wipers on. That's what I did. And what do you think happened? It smeared. So what's the next thing I did? I did the washer fluid, and guess what happened? It got worse. It got so bad that I literally could not see out the windshield, and it was dark out. And so now I'm on the highway, right, driving to Buffalo, and I'm thinking, i got to pull off. But then my prefrontal cortex shows up, and it says, and exactly what are we going to do when we're on the side of the highway with the windshield that we can't see out of? And my, I mean, literally, my heart was pounding. I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? All this is happening in like 10 or 15 seconds. And then my wise mind shows up, and it says, just keep driving. Right? Just keep driving as though you're not having a panic attack right now. So I kept driving, and I was just trying to find little places where I might be able to see the road. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, guess what happened? I couldn't see. And it wasn't because there weren't bugs on the windshield. It wasn't because they weren't smeared everywhere. Somehow my brain figured out how to see through the bugs. It was absolutely miraculous. And so I thought, oh, wow, the stuff I teach really does work. You know? I mean, the fact that my brain figured out a way to do it. But of course, we know that, right? We know that with people who are blind, they can hear better. We know that all kinds of disabilities our brain accommodates. But if we accommodate our brain, then all it knows is that everything is scary, and it would love for you to live in your bedroom all alone with it, anxiety. The only way to live your life fully is to take risks, to tolerate uncertainty, to seek out discomfort, and not to turn on your windshield wipers. OK. So here's some of the things you can help your kids say. Boss back the worry. You might want to join me. I'm about to take a test. So remember that paradox? Rather than thinking, oh, I hope I don't have anxiety before the test, you actually want to welcome it. You know, when the kid sits next, you say, you know what, actually, anxiety is sitting there. Um, you're going to have to sit over somewhere else. Allow it to come with you. The more you change your relationship with fear so that you're not afraid of it and you're bringing it closer to you, the less power it has. 
welcome the fear. Say, hello, worry. So I say to kids who wake up with anxiety, yeah, lay there and have a conversation with it. Be like, well, hello, guess what we're going to do today? You're probably going to worry about that. You might even worry about that, but we're going to have to find out the facts by going to school, OK? Um, applaud its audacity. Nice try, but you can do better than that. Seek it out. I could worry about that. Boss it back. You're not helping me. I think I'm going to ignore you. Staying in the doubt. Maybe my fear will happen. Maybe it won't, but I'll handle it, whatever happens. OK, by the way, another interesting fact is that people don't come to see me in crisis. If someone's been in a car accident or someone, um, whatever, had a horrible illness, um, they don't come to see me. People come to see me because they're afraid these things are going to happen. That's called anticipatory anxiety. And those of you who are parents and you're worried about your child, this is what I say to you. Worry is putting negative energy onto your child. I bet never you, thought, you never thought about it that way, right? It isn't helpful to worry. Your brain is going to send you the worry anyways. You can't stop the thought or stop the worry or stop the feeling. But how you respond to it by choosing not to connect to it by choosing to do the next thing anyways, by bossing it back, that's how your amygdala quiets down, and then it'll stop sending you all those worries, OK? Uh, I'm, I'm about to lose this thing down my pants <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> it, it will be my social anxiety fear come true. Um, OK, so then what do I want you to do? I want you guys to take risks together. I want you to go out. And my, the last video is going to be a video of uh, families and kids taking risks. But hopefully you're getting the message tonight. I'm going to teach you how to coach your children. But hopefully you're getting the message tonight that if you're staying home on your computer doing nothing, by the way, many of my socially anxious kids have socially anxious parents because it's Neurobiological, we, it's hereditary, right? If as an adult you have an anxiety disorder, your children have a one in four chance of getting an anxiety disorder, okay? It's just how it is. You don't have to blame yourself for it. You don't have to feel bad about it. But you do want to equip your children with what to do. So one way to do that is to have fun. We love to whitewater raft. We climb mountains, we jump off of cliffs, and every time I do it, uh, I scream and yell the whole way, and my kids are like, you know, we're going to take a video and actually show your clients what you look like when you face your fears, because it isn't pretty. Um, but at least I'm doing it, right? And I'm like, this is the craziest thing ever. I can't believe we're doing this. And I'm like, let's go. Here we go. Because I do it because it keeps me um, well, and it keeps me living my life fully. In my book, um, I, I give a particular um, skill, and then I ask my clients, does anybody want to um, write a little thing about the skill that is most helpful to, for them? So you'll see all kinds, I only use their first names, but all kinds of my clients gave their um, thoughts about the different things that I write in the book. But one man talks about going to Israel, and he says, I go to Israel because I have anxiety. Because if I didn't go to Israel, I would be home alone with my anxiety. And so that's what I'm talking about, that if you've got an anxious kid, you can't afford to sit in your room or sit on the couch on your computer or watching Netflix all the time. You've got to look in the paper, go look at what's happening, introduce yourself. I, I was at um, a memorial service uh, last weekend, and it was for my sister, and she was a Harley biker. Now, I, we adopted her, and I say, okay, so I'm the, the square one of the family. And so we were at a biker bar with 150 Harley dudes. Talk about socially uncomfortable, right? Um, but it was the greatest thing ever, and I forced myself to go to every single table and introduce myself as Tamara's sister, and I said, I bet you never would have guessed that this is what I looked like, um, because my sister was a little Korean uh, who was a badass. Um, and so she, it was funny, because she would always say she was Norwegian, because I'm Norwegian, uh, but she was Korean, and people looked funny, but she was a badass. So you know, you, you've got to do things outside of your comfort zone in order to stay well. Start when they're babies. So become a coach. So let me teach you about coaching. In the handouts that I gave you, uh, there should be um, a handout on coaching. And there should also be a resource handout that has tons of great resources, including webinars that you can go to for free. Um, 
But this is what I want you guys to start, the language I want you to start using. And by the way, all the staff here have learned the same language. So if we now have you using the language with your child at home and your teachers and principals and counselors using this language with the kids at school, oh my gosh, we are gonna beat anxiety. And I'm just so thrilled that so many people now are wanting to learn how to do this. So number one is you wanna validate the child's feelings and help them to identify it as anxiety, okay? So you want to be able to say, you know, and they have like a deer in the headlights look. It's pretty easy to know when your child's feeling anxious or they're really angry and irritable, okay? But you want to be able to either give it a name or call it anxiety, but just say, I can really see that you're feeling anxious, okay? You want to be, that's the face it part. Know who your opponent is. Don't believe that it's because, you know, Susie is full of drama and she's just leaving me out. That's what we call content. Um, and so now nobody wants to hang out with me and, um, and so I'm just gonna stay at home and I don't need anybody anymore. Well, that's all content, but what's really happened is they're feeling left out, that's creating anxiety for me, and they're gonna avoid social situations anymore. So we're gonna call it what it is, which is you're really feeling anxious about how to get back into your social group, okay? So that's what number one would be. Um, and you see I have kind of examples for you up there. Number two, and maybe that should, this one should be number one, do not reassure someone who's anxious. And you guys are doing it all the time, okay? It's natural if you're a parent to want your child to be happy. So when they're saying, I don't feel good, or I don't think I can go to school, or what if, what if they bully me today? Now, all that's real stuff. It really does feel scary. They really are pooping and peeing and vomiting because they're so scared, okay? but you don't want to say you'll be fine. You don't want to say nothing bad will happen because we can't guarantee that. And besides which, that's not what develops resilience, right? What develops resilience is their ability to be skilled enough to say, I can handle it. If I have to throw up at school, I can use the garbage can. I can ask for a pass. If no one's gonna sit with me at the lunch table, I can go up to a table that I've never met before and say, hey, I see you have a seat. I think I'm gonna eat my lunch here. We want them to be skilled. So you reassuring them by saying you'll be fine, you'll always do well on tests, you don't have anything to worry about. Not only is it not helpful, but now keep thinking about that circuit, you have become a part of what's telling their amygdala that, well, there must be something wrong because you had to let them know it was okay. So you don't wanna do that, okay? Instead of reassuring them, because that's what you guys were saying, well then what do we do, right? So instead of reassuring them, you help the child to tolerate their uncomfortable feelings and convey <clears throat> confidence in their bravery. So this looks like, I know you're feeling pretty bad right now, but I wonder if you can start getting dressed even though you feel yucky. I'll make you a special breakfast to celebrate. You're worried about the test today. I can understand that. Remember who's the boss. Let anxiety join you and show them what you can do. Now, you can't use this language if you haven't explained to the child about anxiety, but now you all know. Tell them about their brain. Tell them that they have this overactive amygdala. Tell them that it's giving them wrong information and mixed signals and exaggerates um, discomfort. Um, and then give them some language like this. And by the way, you can show this to your kids too, okay? Um, it can be hard to eat in the lunchroom not knowing who you'll sit with. You'll probably feel nervous for a few days. Let's see if we can make a plan on what to do if you don't find someone to eat lunch with. Let's work towards tolerating your feelings at school without texting me. <laughs> okay, how many of you moms are getting text messages from your kids at school? Yes. Okay, eee, gotta stop that. By the way, don't leave here today and like cut your kid off of everything. You'll, you'll, you'll send them to the hospital. Um, but you, you do, are some of you kids here? <laughs> okay, but you do wanna have a conversation that every time they text you, they're completing the circuit. Every time you text them back, you're completing the circuit and you're only ensuring that they will have anxiety in school tomorrow. We want to build the I can handle it muscle, that I can get through this discomfort. Emotions are always temporary. The, these chemicals are not dangerous to you and get to the end of the day, okay? I was working with a little girl who's in <clears throat> second grade and she's had just 
horrible fear of her mom not being there when she gets picked up from school. And we've tried, she's a super smart little girl, so I've tried every trick in the bag I have, and she's smarter than me. <laughs> and she finds a way to reassure herself anyways. Well, Kimberly, um, I know maybe my mom won't pick me up, or maybe she will, but I know how to look out the window and look for her car. That's what she does when she, so I'm like, dang, she's a smart little chick. Um, and then I, so, so then she was visiting me this week, and I said to her mom, I wonder if, I, if you could leave halfway through the session and I could bring her back to school, if you'd let me take her in my car, I could meet her teacher, I could talk with the counselor, and then she would have the discomfort, right, of kind of not knowing, is Kimberly going to bring me back? Is she not going to bring me back? What's this going to be like? Um, and the mom said, okay, that's a good idea. Let's, let's try that. Well, so the girl gets in my car and she's carrying this little backpack. And she proceeds to open up the backpack, and she's like, Kimberly, look at everything I've got in my, in my backpack to handle me feeling anxious about you taking me to school. This is, you can picture, right? She gets out this little lavender uh, essential oil, so she puts it on, she dabs it all over herself. She gets out thinking putty, so she takes out the thinking putty, and she's doing this. Now, you guys all probably are thinking, well, boy, those parents really provide her with some great things to handle her anxiety while she's at school. But now that you understand the brain, every one of those things is telling her that she can't handle that discomfort. So guess what I had to do? I had to have come to Jesus talk with the mom and dad and say, everything I've taught, no wonder why she's not getting better, because I tell her to handle it. We practice handling it in session. She does great with me in session. And then you guys go buy her two more things. To, uh, to do just in case she feels anxious at school. So hopefully you guys are kind of getting the idea of this, right? Be a cheerleader, a cheerleader for her. Um, help them tolerate their anxious feelings. I'm so proud of you for finishing your homework even though you were feeling overwhelmed. You did a great job of staying in school today even though you missed me. I really appreciate how hard you worked to go to school today, even though anxiety didn't want you to go. Do you, I begin to hear that language? When kids leave my office, I say, I sure hope you feel bad today. Um, boy, you know what, if you can get a C on a test, I have a reward box in my office, if you can get a C on your test, you can get two rewards on my box next time. You know, parents are like, ah, don't tell them to get a C. By the way, if you have your kids practice the opposite of what they're afraid of, you will never make them a, a student who doesn't care or a, someone who isn't responsible. Anxious kids are highly intelligent, highly sensitive kids. They will always care. But you will be giving them skills to handle things in the future when they don't go well. Change the emotion. Anger and frustration and upset give anxiety power. Many of you are having arguments with your kids, you're fighting with your kids, you're fighting with your spouse over this. All of that gives it power. Find a way to have fun with it, be silly with it, play with it. I sometimes say to families when they first come to me, um, if you can make for dinner something that everybody likes and then a couple dishes that everybody hates, and then get one fantastic dessert. One of those caramel brownies at Wegmans, they sell them single. So go get one of those and say, whoever eats the most food that they don't like gets to have the brownie at the end. That takes the, the pressure off the kid as being the person with the anxiety, and it helps all of you figure out how to handle things that are uncomfortable, right? Um, so that's the kind of thing that you want to do um, <clears throat> in terms of being playful and changing the emotion. If kids have really bad thoughts, I'll have them write their thoughts on pieces of paper. That alone can be hard to do because like, they don't want to look at the thought. And then we'll scrum, we'll scrum them up and we'll just play hoops with them. Oh yeah, there, there goes, I'm going to, there's a baby, but she doesn't know hell. But oh, I'm going to hell today. Oh, my mom's going to die today. We're just whipping balls all over the place with these bad thoughts. Kids need to learn that everybody has those kinds of thoughts in their heads. And just because we think them doesn't make them true, right? Some of you are listening. Um, and then I reward their um, behavior. That's why I've got the books for adults. I've got um, a, a box with really good rewards. So if you've got a child who's just refusing to do this, it's because you don't have good enough rewards. And there's a difference between a reward and a bribe. A bribe is when you give it to them before they go to school, and a reward is when they have done the behavior. They've slept all night long in their own bed, or they've studied for the test. Um, I, listen, my son, who's now in college, I think 
you know, when he was a senior, I was still rewarding him. <laughs> if you can remember to do this and this, I will take you out for a mocha at the end of the week. Um, so um, rewards are very important, and we all reward ourselves, right? I hate paperwork. I go to coffee culture to get my paperwork done. That's how I make it doable for me. So don't be afraid to give rewards, and sometimes to get a kid through an anxiety disorder, you have to really come up with some really meaningful rewards. So as we get to the end of this, um, and then we're gonna, you guys can ask me questions, um, one of the tricky places that anxiety will hit you is it'll say to you, this isn't working, mom or dad. Uh, you told me that this would help, but it's not working. So what I say is we're not, doing, we're not trying to get rid of anxiety. We're trying to help you tolerate anxiety. So the goal is to tolerate anxiety, and the outcome eventually will be decreased anxiety. I know that because I see it happen. Sometimes it can take a full year for someone to look back and be like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe how far I've come. So don't, if, if your kid says to you, it's not working, say, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not trying to get anything to work. We're just practicing these skills so that we calm your amygdala down and it eventually learns to behave itself. And so you're learning some skills just to hold a space for these bad feelings right now and I'm holding that space with you. And we're just riding the wave of anxiety until it passes and your wise mind can show up, okay? So success is in the trying, it isn't in accomplishing anything. I just want kids to try to do these things that are uncomfortable, um, even if they're not quote unquote successful. Reward them when they face a fear, have them look for opportunities to feel bad and report their success, and make sure you're sharing your own struggles. That's one thing I do a lot. Um, a lot of times moms are you know, the main coaches, although I want you men to know that you make better coaches because you're not so emotionally involved. Um, the part that you dads miss is the validating up front. You guys go straight to um, pushing them through. <laughs> it, it's really important to say, I get that you're feeling that bad and this is super, super scary for you, um, and then push them through, okay? Um, but. Uh, I, I find that particularly dads at the dinner table, if they can talk about what happened that day and how hard it was for them, maybe they had a meeting that they had to give a speech at and their hands were shaking, um, maybe they weren't sure, they heard that a bunch of layoffs were happening and they're worried that they might get laid off, share your own experiences with anxiety and how you're handling it. Don't share it and not handle it, but share so the kids see, oh, everybody feels anxious and this is how we get through it, okay? Um, what else? Make sure you take small steps. Another mistake people make after workshops like this is they just like go for it and they like throw their kid in the ocean, so don't do that. Make that hierarchy, list the things, figure out what creates the least amount of anxiety um, and start with that. Model how to handle big emotions, anxiety and fear by talking openly about it. Use those words courageous and brave. Notice and celebrate when they do something even though, so that's the language you're gonna say, you did this even though you were feeling nervous or afraid or scared, and that's what you're gonna reward them for, or at least you know, just verbally praise them, say I'm so proud of you. Challenge them to keep walking forward and climbing over obstacles. I, you know, Obstacles, I don't care about obstacles. They, they show up, I find a way around, through, under, that's what we want our kids to do, okay? Have conversations about living a balanced life, and challenge unrealistic expectations. That gets back to the perfectionist. I, I have a, a girl I'm working with right now who's a senior who's taking a, a college um, calculus class, and somehow her and her parents got information, I don't know where because it's wrong information, that if she didn't take this college calculus class, she wasn't going to be able to get into the engineering program at Penn State as a freshman. And I said, well, nobody gets into the engineering program at Penn State as a freshman. Everybody starts out in the general things and you take your first year or two years and then you apply to go into the engineering school. And she had put so much pressure on herself that she developed mono, that she wasn't able to go to school and she's a straight A perfectionist student. And this was all because her and her parents believed that she had to get an A and go to this college cal class. Um, so make sure that you're not putting unrealistic expectations on your child. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about relaxation because everyone's probably wondering why haven't we talked about relaxation yet. Does anyone want to guess why I leave it for the end? What do you think relaxation can become? A, a, a crutch, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and by the way, it can become a trigger too, because your belly breathing can become a trigger. There's different things that become a trigger. But anything that you do to get away from anxiety or to get it to quiet down becomes part of that circuit where the amygdala says you can't handle it. So let me explain how we use these things. First of all, <clears throat> let me teach you about breathing. So breathing is something that's free. We always have it. It can quiet emotions very quickly. Um, but you want to use it not to get rid of anxiety, but to kind of be with anxiety, okay? Now, when people breathe, if you're telling your kid, you know, chill out, take a breath, let's pretend you're all super stressed, and pay attention to your own body, and then kind of pay attention to the bodies next to you, okay? I want you all to, you know, I'm gonna say to you, you're super stressed, just chill out and take a breath, everybody. So take your breath, big breath, and pay attention to where you're breathing from. So, what part of your body did you notice moving? Anyone want to tell me? Your stomach? Ooh, someone took my workshop already. Good job. What else, what, who else another part of their body moved? Chest. Most people breathe like this. Okay. And notice what I also did. I went, I took a really big inhale. Well, guess what? That's the opposite of what works. If, if any of you did that, right now, take three breaths with a big inhale. Go. Now notice what you're feeling. You just took in a bunch of oxygen, and your muscles need oxygen to get the heck out of Dodge. So your brain is paying attention to how much oxygen and carbon dioxide you're getting. And if you take in a big uh, inhale with oxygen, your brain says, we must be in trouble, and it releases more chemicals. So when you tell your kids to take a deep breath, and they go, you've just made their anxiety worse, and so have they. So the kind of breath you want them to take, everybody put their hand on their bellies. Thank you for whoever said that. And you want them, I say smell the roses and blow out the candles. You also want them to think of their belly as a balloon. When they take breath in, you want them to blow up their belly. And when they exhale, you want them to deflate the balloon. If they have a hard time understanding how to do this, just have them lay on the ground and put a book on their belly and have them move the book up and move the book down, okay? But we're all going to do it together. Let's take three breaths. I'm going to coach you through it, okay? You're going to smell the flowers. You're going to go, it's just a very gentle, shallow inhale. And then we're going to blow out the candles. <sighs> Pretend you're 50 years old, okay? So. Here we go. Smell the flowers. You get to see my belly go up. Blow out the candles. Smell the flowers. Blow out the candles. Smell the flowers. Blow out the candles. That's how you breathe. We know that people with anxiety disorders don't have enough carbon dioxide, baseline carbon dioxide. They actually are wired to take in too much oxygen. So we actually practice that type of breathing twice a day, about 15 minutes each day. There's actually a program now called Free Spira. If you want more information about that, Heimark is now paying for it. It's just a tablet that teaches you how to breathe six breaths per minute with a shallow inhale and a long exhale. But I just taught you how to do it, so that's all you need. So now, if you're really upset, if you're angry, if you're crying and you don't want to cry, if you're feeling anxious, it will all quiet the emotion. But we don't want kids to think it's to get rid of anxiety. It's just to help you be with anxiety, OK? Um, mindfulness is the ability to be present and accept what is without judging. It's beautiful with anxiety. Because it's just saying and noting, I'm feeling anxious right now. That's not good or bad. I'm not going to try to get away from it. I'm just going to allow it to be. I say, accept and allow. Just accept and allow. And if I can just accept and allow this feeling, it will, the wave will come and the wave will go all on its own. Okay. Meditation is wonderful. We know uh, it quiets areas of our brain that are helpful to anxiety and depression. Um, but again, I don't want kids to do any of this to get out of a panic attack or to get out of uh, bad thinking. 
What I want them to do is I would love for them to meditate five or ten minutes a day every day to keep them well. I would like them to practice the belly breathing, you know, two or three times a day so that their brain knows how to breathe in enough carbon dioxide or to have enough carbon dioxide in them. Um, I want them to exercise every single day because it's the only other thing other than medicine that balances serotonin. Um, but it has to be what they do to be well, not what they do when they're feeling anxious. So do you guys understand that? I want kids to have a balanced life and to live well and to incorporate all these complementary techniques. These are the other workshops I give. I teach all this stuff. But I want you to do it consistently as part of your wellness formula so that you don't go over your stress threshold and develop an anxiety disorder. Emotional freedom technique, some of you may have heard of that. And you want to raise your hand if you've ever heard of emotional freedom technique? A few of you. It's tapping on acupressure points. Um, which deactivates the amygdala. Um, you tap on them while you say out loud the thing that's stressing you out or that you're afraid of or whatever, and it, it deactivates the amygdala. That's a whole workshop on its own, um, or you can Google it and begin to read more about it. Um, and yoga is, a, is another wonderful thing because I love yoga because it has some of the same things I teach in anxiety. Stay on your mat. Don't compare yourself to others. Um, it, when I was doing this really hard yoga thing, and, and we had to stay in this position, and they just said, stay stay, stay, and my legs are shaking. And then she says, um, connect to your breath and stay some more. Because in life, you never know when you're going to be in a difficult situation and how long you're going to have to stay. I love that. So yoga has all these little great ditties that help kids understand anxiety. And now our community is really getting behind yoga for kids. So you can look up classes. I know that there are places that are doing yoga for kids. Um, all right, I'm not going to give you guys any opportunity to um, ask me questions. I don't think I'm going to um, show, I'll show the last video if no one, you know, if we have time after people ask questions. Here are some resources. You guys have a whole list of resources. I just want you to know that those top two um, websites I give to every high school student and those who are going off to college, and I say, before you call me in a crisis, go to those websites. It will walk you through exactly what you need to do to handle your anxiety. Um, Noises in Your Head is a free video series by a colleague and friend of mine, Reed Wilson, who's an international speaker on anxiety and OCD. And he created a, a, it's like six videos, five minutes long each, where he hired a man and a woman. The woman has anxiety, the man plays anxiety, so it's very funny. And he plays it beautifully. And these are free, and you can watch them with your child. And it teaches each skill how to call it anxiety, how to know if it's anxiety. Um, how to not connect to content, how to handle discomfort and seek it out, how to um, choose uncertainty. And, it, and they play it with different types of anxiety. Um, and I think that's everything. I'll, I'll play this if um, we run out of questions. But let me open it up to questions. Oh, come on. First, OK, I was going to say first question gets a book, so I'll give you a book. Yeah, so, so perfectionism and anxiety, do I have any thoughts? <laughs> I have lots of thoughts about that. Um, so yeah, um, the problem with perfectionism is that um, it's really supported <laughs> in, in, our, in our world and in our life, right? So kids get feedback all the time. They're the top student. Teachers are saying things like, oh, gosh, I wish you would be like, like Joe. Um, you can tell he has studies hard. He gets straight A's every time. They will, they'll have the 100% club, right? And all the names go on. You know, In fifth grade, my daughter was a part of the 100% club. And I'm dying because I'm like, she's already a perfectionist. Now you're just feeding her perfectionism. So um, I, I actually I have a handout, like if you would want to email me or whatever. I have a, a, a little article that I um, have um, particularly teenagers read, and it just talks about why uh, perfectionism is so powerful and how it um, has a negative effect on their well-being. And then what we begin to teach them is to kind of look at the things they have to do for the day or you know, if they're getting ready to apply for colleges, whatever the, their list of things to do, and start to decide what des deserves 100% of their attention, what deserves 50% of the attention, 
what are they going to give 10% of their attention to? Um, and so they can begin to start realizing that not everything gets 100%. There's also kids that are good at everything. They're good artists, and they're good sports players, and they're good students, and they're good singers. So they're singing for the church, and they're playing on three sports teams, and they're taking an art class and going to some big deal where they're showing their art. And, and so I, I say to kids, just because you're good at all of it doesn't mean you're supposed to do all of it. So figure out what, so if you have a test the next day, studying deserves 100% of your attention. If you have a paper due as well, you might only give 75% of your attention to that, knowing that you'll probably get a C or a B on that. But you choose that. By the way, it's so much easier to choose these things rather than to feel like I have to do it because I don't have any choice. Um, so if you say, I'm going to choose to spend an hour writing my paper, even though it wouldn't be my best work, but I'm going to put two hours into studying for a test because that's a big test. And then I'm supposed to make phone calls for um, student council tonight. I'm not going to make the phone calls, but I'm going to text my friend and see if they can. Um, so I teach kids how to do that. And then we literally do practice doing things imperfectly. Um, we, we just come up with things all throughout life, like could you do that imperfectly? Could you do that imperfectly? Anything from doing your hair and makeup imperfectly to um, you know, um, how you're handling a social situation. Um, so you, you want to just kind of talk with them about all the ways that perfectionism kind of um, entangles them in their life and then see if they can turn it around by doing the opposite and choosing some ways to be imperfect, okay? Uh, well, now we have lots of questions. I'm gonna go all the way back there and then I'll come up here. Uh, I, I can't, okay. <laughs> Right, right, so, so I always ask the question, someone can be a perfectionist and they can be getting nothing done. I have the most brilliant kids going to prep and I've got one right now that hasn't handed in homework before he came to see me. He couldn't get his homework handed in because he got paralyzed and he couldn't do it. I've got people who say they have OCD and they're compulsive cleaners and they've got the dirtiest house and car you can imagine because they can't do it, okay? So to me it's always, are you doing too much or are you doing too little? And we're always working at going in the middle. So once you understand that your brain is giving you bad in information about this and exaggerated information, then you want your wise mind, when you're not being triggered, so you, you practice these things when they're not triggered, and you say, so let's, let's think of something where your brain tells you, I can't do that. Um, and let's figure out how you could do some part of that. So I never let a child not do something. They have to do a piece of it. I'm always trying to help them find the middle place, okay? Um, and so then it's like, well, but I, I can't, I, I, literally I have a college student I'm working with right now and he says, I can't do anything unless it's the 11th hour. And now he's behind in three of his classes. So we had to come up with different things. We had to come up with reminders on his phone where a, an alarm will, will um, whatever. We came up with a place where he's more likely to, to study, which is the coffee shop um, at the college. We came up with a friend who is going to text him to study with him. So we had to find other external ways to, so remember it's an anxiety game. I'm always trying to find ways to be smarter than your brain. But if I just tell you what to do, and it turns out that you're a person who overfunctions, doesn't underfunction, well it doesn't help me to get you all these supports, I need to actually bring you down a few notches, and now I want you and your, mo your mom and dad to go out for dinner and um, take up some time so you don't have as much time to study, do you see? So I, I'm always trying to figure out how is anxiety messing with them, and then how do I help them find the middle place, and then how do we get them to act on that? So it's typically lots of rewards if someone's over-functioning, and it's oftentimes bringing in external supports if someone's under-functioning. All right, we had lots of, you had a question. Yeah. Like what, what's your opinion on that being a consistent habit? 
Yeah, so um, anxiety is exhausting, and so is life exhausting. And so I was just literally telling a kid this yesterday, um, because what happens is they're exhausted, and so then they step out, right? They, they, they want to get away from that exhausted feeling, and they go into their bedroom, and they lay down, and they watch YouTube videos until they fall asleep. So this is their routine every single day. And then they don't go to bed till midnight. They don't go to sleep till 1 o'clock, and then they can't get out of bed the next morning. And this is just a perpetual thing. And so what I say to them is being exhausted, you have to look at it as it's no different than having a headache or a stomach ache or anxiety. You have to stay in the flow. You have to stay in the energy. So your habit is to take a break. And even your mind will say to you, you really deserve a break. I mean, all of us adults, right? If we get home from work and we sit on the couch, we're screwed, right? <laughs> we don't get back up. Dinner might not get made. That load of laundry is still in the dryer and doesn't get out. So, you know, they're not any different than us adults. But if they want to be smart and they want to live their life fully and accomplish things, another thing I really work with kids on is what do they value? What do they want to look, their life to look like a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? And so every time they think, oh, today I am going to take that nap, I want them to think, is that going to help me get to, to what I value and get to where I want to be? And I say, so the, the habit needs to change. And it's all just brain habit. Your brain will do whatever you teach it. So I say, as an experiment, every day this week, I want you to come home and stay in the flow. Eat, that's flowing. Go Sit down, get your homework done, that's flowing. Go outside and take a run or shoot some hoops, that's flowing. Do not sit down and rest until after your homework is complete. That might be 8 o'clock, that might be 9 o'clock. And then reward yourself with the rest, okay? So the intentions are very different. But again, now, as a parent, you guys are going to say that to your kids and your kids are going to laugh at you. I get away with that because they respect me. And, um, and I, I, I use a lot, try it as an experiment. Uh, kids are willing to do stuff if they only have to do it for a short period of time. And then I say, and then we'll have a conversation about it again, okay? Oh, I know we're ending. Some people have to leave, but I, I, I will hang. Um, by the way, just so you know, if some of you have to leave, go ahead. I'm going to stay here and um, answer some more questions. I'll do that for about 15 minutes, um, and someone will be back there uh, selling my book. So, go ahead. We have a six-year-old who manifests his anxiety physically, <laughs> and he likes to hit and kick and punch and bang things. Yeah. We don't, you know, like we do a lot of what you already talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, so, so for me, I would want what I call functional analysis. I, I would want to know, you know, what's going on. Can we figure out a trigger? How old is he? Six tomorrow. He's six. So these little kids, that is their MO. The only way they know how to express how bad they feel outside is to express, or inside, is to express it outside, okay? So, so they don't know what's going on and why they're feeling so bad. So ideally, we begin to figure out, is, do we begin to see a shift? What can we do to help calm them before they get into an anxiety episode? That's all the proactive stuff. That's when you can do relaxation, you know, these weighted blankets, all these things. Um, just going for a walk, uh, using tapping to tap it out. All these things, um, um, even being courageous and brave. I don't know if you have an example. Do you have an example of, of what might cause them to tantrum? Okay, yeah, so, so this is a good example. So once I figure that out, now he's going to continue to scream as long as he feels dangerous. I can't really stop that from happening. What I can do is start teaching his amygdala to handle crowds. So we would start by, um, you know, um, getting a whole bunch of puppets out and having a crowd of puppets and being saying, you know, giving it a name. Hey, Charlie, we got lots of puppets around here and, and go ahead, uh, tell me to hate this because I can handle puppets. Then I might Google crowds and have him talk back to 
Charlie while he's looking at crowds, and then I would say, okay, now let's be brave, let's think, and, and kids are great. Like once they're on the other side of this, I'm like, now where could we go where there would be some people? The more that he can be like, well, there's people at McDonald's, oh, and there's french fries at McDonald's too. Well, let's wait and go to a time where it's gonna be busier, not lighter. So as soon as you start getting him to do that, his outbursts will quiet once his amygdala quiets. His amygdala isn't going to quiet until you are proactively doing exposures and he's learning how to handle it. And then you'll notice, that's what this mom said to me yesterday, she's like, I can't even believe it now. He can go to preschool without crying, he can, um, he can sit at the dinner table without crying, and that's because we figured out what was triggering him and we were purposely exposing him to that and he wasn't scared of them anymore. So that's your key, is to be proactive in exposing him to crowds in, in different places. Okay, one more question, then I'll let people go and I'll stay up. Yes? Um, so he, you say he goes from zero to six, I want to try and make sure you guys, his temper. <laughs> you guys want to have like therapy sessions with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm feeling put on the spot right now. First of all, I don't know if anxiety is driving that or not. I don't know um, if he has some impulse control problems. Someone who, go, who, who has a lot of emotionality. Uh, again, no matter what the issue is, I want to work with them on the front side to understand what kinds of stuff triggers you to go from zero to 60. And how can we practice that uh, in my office, in life, to manage doing that um, and, and then, I, you know, I, I might give him, you know, just a whole bunch of skills. Um, before you scream, I want you to walk because I need that energy moving through your body and getting directed in another way and not out this way. I always say, most people don't know that that emotion will calm down if you do nothing with it. So oftentimes I'll say, don't address anything until you've rid ridden the wave of anger. So you're going to feel angry, but let, let's, you know, and again, this is where rewards come in. You know, hey, we'll, we'll give you 10 bucks every time you feel that surge of anger, you walk away, and then once you've ridden the wave of the emotion, you come back. And maybe you'll talk to us about it, or maybe in your room you'll text me something about it. A lot of teens, I have them text me. They, they're, they're either too ashamed of what they're thinking and feeling, or they're too overwhelmed by it, or they just don't like to talk to an adult. But I'll just say, just, just text me what's going on. Um, and if they can do that from their bedroom, now we're beginning to find a middle place, right? So it's just working with someone to get to find those middle places um, and, and to have them believe. See, right now he probably doesn't even believe that he's capable of any of that. So I want him to know that, no, he's just being hijacked by his amygdala um, and it's giving him bad information. And so he's got to wait it out until his amygdala quiets down and he can think of the next thing to do, okay? All right, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm sorry for keeping you late. Um, I'll play this video if anyone wants to stay and see it because it's a little bit fun. This is just a great video on um, families and kids taking risks. Maybe, or maybe I got locked out of. Oh well, maybe I'm out of the uh, thing, so you guys can go. <laughs> oh, no, here it is. <laughs> Don't sit back down, keep going. <coughs> You'll just hear the music as you go. Huh. 